Welcome, obviously, to our Women's Monthly Bible Study. It's so lovely to have you here for this. Um, before we dive in, let me start with a word of prayer, and then I'll do a slight recap because for those of you who are uh, here for the first time, and then we'll dive into our topic for tonight. So let me go ahead and pray. Father, thank you so much for this precious time to be together this evening. I know it's a cold night, but I just thank you for each person who is here. Thank you for bringing us together. We're always so, so, so mindful of the privilege it is to be able to meet publicly, to study your word, to talk about how to do Christianity, how to follow you wholeheartedly. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would bless our time as we gather, be in our midst, and um, bless me as I speak. Would you speak through me? I pray this would be a helpful and encouraging time for all of us as we think through what it means to follow you. In your name, amen. Okay, so yes, yeah, so you all know we're going through this series, Freedom From, Freedom For, which has been great so far. Um, and it's based on the verse Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. So this is our fourth, fourth session. So just a quick recap. In the first session that we did in September, we just looked at the first part of that verse. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. And we thought through what that meant. And then we thought about, in the second session, the inner conflict that we daily experience with our flesh, our sinful nature, and the spirit. So even though Christ has set us free from being under the tyranny of sin, we are still bound up in this sinful nature. We do sin every day. So how, what does freedom in Christ look like in the midst of that battle when our flesh keeps wanting us to serve sin, but he has equipped us instead to serve God? So that was our second session. And then in the third session, Simona led us through an amazing session, thinking through the spiritual battleground of lies and accusations. So how do we walk in freedom and stand firm against the lies of the enemy? And tonight, we're going to turn to another taskmaster that I think will may be familiar for some of us. It's certainly familiar to me, and it's uh, something that constantly wants to re-enslave us and cause us to sin, and that's comparison. So tonight we're going to be thinking about how Jesus sets us free from comparison and sets us free for contentment. Now, I wonder what comes to your mind when you think about comparison. Perhaps you've heard that famous phrase, keeping up with the Joneses, which is basically that idea, right, that you're competing with your neighbors, the Joneses, to see who has the better car, the better house, the better Christmas decorations, the better kids, you name it, the better anything, really or just noticing if they've got something that you want to catch up and try and get ahead of them. Theodore Roosevelt famously said, comparison is the thief of joy. And I would certainly concur with him on that. And I would add to it, it's also the thief of contentment. And for me, two of the biggest areas of my life where I have struggled with comparison have been in the areas of body image and earthly success. So some of you may know when I was younger, I used to do ballet. And when I was about 13 or 14, someone made a really, really harsh comment about my body size in a ballet class. And for me, it triggered a, a path of discontent that heavily shaped my teens and my 20s, impacting how I ate, how I viewed and valued my body. And what began was a comparison game, sometimes between me and other people, but actually more often than not, it became a comparison between the real me and the ideal me that I carried about in my mind. So if I was skinnier than normal, I felt better, than, better about myself. But if I was heavier than normal, then I felt worse. And this is something that plagued me for years, well into my late 20s. And I will share how the Lord has walked with me through this a bit later in this talk. But that struggle was a huge area, has been a huge area, a pitfall for me in my life, a real plague that I have to constantly resist. Now, you might not be like me where body image is an issue for you, but maybe there are other things that you compare. Maybe it's your marriage, or your house, or your friendships, or your clothes, or how you dress your kids, what kind of schools your kids go to, your job. It could be a whole host of things that foster discontent, or a whole host of things that we compare with each other and fosters discontent in us, makes us feel like we need to constantly get ahead. And I think maybe you could agree with me, not only is this an exhausting way to live, but it also very quickly becomes a sinful one as well. So just as we begin, I just want to take two minutes, this is just for yourself, just to get the juices flowing in your minds, and I just want you to think to yourself, think about two questions. One, are there any areas of your life where you're right now finding yourself frequently comparing yourself to others? 
And then two, how does that usually make you feel about yourself and about them? So maybe just take, just take a few minutes and think about that in your mind. I'll let you mull over that as we keep going about tonight. And again, that's not something you need to share with somebody else, but just something to maybe think about on your own. Now, this is a massive topic comparison. So what I want to do tonight is I just want to do three things. First, I want to think about what comparison is. Second, I want to highlight two pitfalls of comparison that can occur and think about where we see examples of this biblically. And then finally, I want to think practically. Because the fact is, comparison isn't going anywhere in our lives. As soon as we turn on our phones, as soon as we turn on the TV, as soon as we walk out the door, we face the temptation to compare ourselves. And so how, practically, has Jesus set us free from comparison? And how does he set us free for contentment? So first, what is comparison? Well, to begin with, I think it's important to say that in and of itself, comparison is actually not a bad thing. At its very basic level, it's literally just an objective process of comparing two or more people or things. That's literally the Cambridge English Dictionary definition. And when it remains objective, it actually can be quite a constructive process. So when I was recovering from my second hip surgery, I took up swimming. And I, I knew how to swim in the ocean and keep myself afloat, but I never actually had learned how to swim for exercise. So each time I'd go to the pool, because I didn't want to pay for lessons, I would just sneakily watch some of the better swimmers just to see how they did it. So I would watch to see, you know, when did they take their breaths between strokes? How did they do their strokes? How did they do their kick? And honestly, it was it's been extremely helpful in me developing my own kind of swimming style, has just been watching the people who are better at it and seeing what they do. And spiritually, Paul calls us to be imitators of him and of Jesus, of course, which implies some level of comparison where we see how we're doing things currently, but observe this person's doing this better and we want to be imitators of that. And indeed, sometimes when writing to churches, he actually brings up the examples of others, not to shame the ones he's writing to, but rather to spur them on through the example of fellow believers. So it's not inherently wrong to look at someone else and appreciate that they're actually doing well in some area of their lives and to allow that to produce a good fruit in us and produce good work. So I have this right now in my life on Instagram. There's a girl I follow in the U.S. who leads a ministry out there and she's had a huge impact on my faith. I'm so inspired by how she lives, how she speaks about the Lord with such conviction, boldness. Um, clarity, and it's really been helping me think through in my own life areas I want to grow in. So comparison can actually be constructive. But there's another kind of comparison, and perhaps this is what we might tend to think to automatically, and might be what you thought of when you came tonight. It's certainly what I thought of when I was planning this talk. And it's what I would call not constructive comparison, but destructive comparison. So when it stops being an objective process, and instead causes us to stumble by leading us to view ourselves and others in a sinful way. And usually this happens in one of two ways. So either we see someone doing well in a certain area of our lives or their lives, and we start to feel overly bad about ourselves, you know, and that can often lead us to then feel envious or maybe even angry or resentful towards the person who's doing better. Or on the other hand, we see someone in an area of life where we feel we're doing pretty well and then we start to feel overly good about ourselves and it can lead us to be conceited and to look at someone else with contempt. So for example, let's just take the body image issue, right? You walk into a room, you compare yourself to someone and think, man, they are so much slimmer than I am, so much more beautiful than I am. Oh, I really feel terrible about how I look now. Why did God, why did you make me this way? And it can produce envy. Or you look at someone else and you think, Wow, I'm a lot slimmer than they are. Or wow, I look really great today compared to them. And that produces conceit. Because when you have comparison, you have, you have a, it's a better or a worse, right? There's a winner and a loser. Whether you end up being the loser or the winner, that's the two, the two sides of the, pit, the spectrum. And both responses are pitfalls because they're actually just plain old sinful deeds of the flesh as we read about in Galatians 5. They're not acts of the spirit. They're acts of the flesh. And they hurt our relationships. And in fact, they hurt three relationships in particular. They hurt our relationship to ourselves, they hurt our relationship to others, and they hurt our relationship to God. So with ourselves, they hurt ourselves because it inflates our sense of self. If you notice, both responses are actually totally self-centered, either puffing us up or beating us down, and they cause us to focus inwards. But they also skew our sense of self because suddenly our sense of self-worth fluctuates depending on what environment you're in, right? So when you're around someone who you feel is worse than you, you feel good. When you're around someone who feels better than you, you feel, you feel 
worse about yourself. So your self-worth is extremely um, unpredictable, changeable. It also hurts our relationship to others because it hinders us from loving others well. In John 15, Jesus says, Love one another as I have loved you. When we secretly harbor envy or resentment against someone who has what we want, or we view someone with contempt and disdain because we think we're better than them, we are not loving them as Jesus loved us. And finally, the unseen third party who's impacted here is God. Because on the one hand, if we feel we're being shortchanged when we see someone else getting what we want or receiving blessing in an area where we want blessing, the danger is to start to believe that God hasn't been as good to me as he was to them. I don't know if you recognize that, but that's the lie of the enemy that we talked about last time. It's the lie that casts doubt on God's goodness. Or alternatively, we feel so great, so good about ourselves that we put ourselves on the throne to cast judgment on brothers and sisters, which also damages our relationship to God. So both extremes are damaging in these three fundamental relationships of our lives. A few years ago or so, I was walking along the canal in Harrison Park, as I used to often do when I lived down that way. And for some reason on that day, I was feeling particularly low about my life and about my career and how I hadn't achieved very much in the world. And I was thinking of all the people I'd studied with in St. Andrews, people I follow on Instagram whose lives looked so glamorous, so successful. And I was just walking along just feeling worse and worse and worse about my life. And lo and behold, at that exact moment, who should be walking towards me on the canal but literally one of the couples I was thinking about. I had studied with them at St. Andrews. I followed them on Instagram and I was harboring some rather envious thoughts about <laughs> their situation in life. And honestly, when I saw them walking towards me, my heart dropped because the last thing I wanted to do in that moment was greet them, be friendly to them, be excited about their successes in life. The thought of love your neighbor as yourself was very far from my mind. But of course, I couldn't just walk by. You know, I did say hello. I chatted to them for a bit and actually it was really nice. It was great to hear how they were doing. But when I walked on, I just immediately sank down into my feelings of lowness about my lack of success in life and my in these feelings of comparison. So I, and I'm laughing only because I'm laughing at myself in this, but I cried out my complaint to God and I just fully expected from him to, to give me compassion, pity and comfort. I, I expected him to say, poor UK did has indeed been much harder for you than it has been for them. <laughs> but instead I had a really strong sense from the Lord, stop. And I actually heard a phrase, and it stayed with me, because it, it, it was a strong phrase. It said, it's not my prerogative to pander to your pride. Which was basically, it's not my his priority to make me feel like an earthly success in this game of comparison against my brother. And that for me, it was a real wake-up call in that moment. Because I realized that in me comparing myself to them, it was me turning in on myself, feeling horrible about my life in comparison to theirs. It made me feel resentful towards them. And deep down, it made me doubt God's goodness and guidance in the unique journey of my life that he had led me through. And I also heard that question, have I not led you? And I really felt then, I have not, you know, I really felt convicted in that moment about my response to how the Lord has worked in my life. And we have examples of both extreme responses to comparison throughout the Bible. There are many, many, many. I've just picked three tonight to highlight. So first you have the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. So in this story, both brothers bring God an offering. Cain an offering from the ground and Abel an offering from the flock. And while God accepts Abel's offering, he doesn't accept the offering brought by Cain. Now, it's important to mention this is not an instance of God playing favorites here. This, it wasn't the substance of the offering that was the problem. If we read in Leviticus and Numbers, grain offerings and offerings from the flock were equally acceptable. The only evident difference that we read in this story is that it specifies that while Cain brought God an offering, Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. He brought the first of their fat portions. He brought, in other words, he brought the first fruits of what he had to give to God whereas Cain didn't. And so God accepts Abel's offering, but not Cain's. And then what happens? The result is Cain gets angry. In fact, in Hebrew, it says his anger burned. But then God speaks to Cain. I always find this amazing. He doesn't sit back and wait for Cain to come to him. He reaches out to Cain and actually tries to help him work through his anger. He says to him, Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? In other words, it's an invitation. Cain, talk to me. Tell me why you're angry. What's going on here? 
And then he warns Cain. He tells Cain that sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for him. In other words, it's sin is there trying to get him to react in his anger and envy towards his brother. And the Lord is saying, Cain, you've got a choice. Don't do it. Don't give in. But sadly, what does Cain do? Well, we have no record of him engaging with God in that moment like he does later. Rather, we have him take Abel to a field and kill him, the first act of murder in the Bible. This is like the paramount example of destructive comparison. Or later in the Old Testament, we have the story of Saul and David. Saul originally loves David, if you remember. He ends up giving his daughter in marriage to David. He benefits from the beautiful music that David plays to calm his troubled mind. He makes him a trusted commander in his army. But then over time, Saul's love for David is poisoned as he starts to feel competitive with David. He hears people singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands, and his heart is inflamed with envy. And from that day on, he tries to kill David, and literally he spends the rest of his life hunting David down. The rest of his life is defined by his competitiveness with David and his envy towards him. Now, in our lives, I truly hope and highly doubt that any of us have ever been driven to that level of anger against another person if we've seen them succeeding where we haven't succeeded. But when we compare ourselves to others and allow jealousy or envy to fester in us, even if it doesn't result in the act of committing murder, it can lead to bitterness and anger in our hearts towards them that hinders our love for them. And Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, murder is something that starts in your hearts. James 4, 1 to 4 says, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So those are some examples in the Bible that we have where comparison leads us to feel that envy towards someone else, that anger towards someone else. But there's also examples in the other extreme where it can, comparison can lead us to feel better about ourselves over someone else. And I'm sure you're familiar with this parable told by Jesus in Luke 18. It's a bit short, so I'll just read it out. And he told also this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. If we look at the prayer of the Pharisee, we can notice a few things. He thanks God, but not for anything that God has done. He thanks God that he is so great. Thank you that I am so much better than all those people over there, including this guy I walked in with. And then he goes on and lists the good things that he does. It's as if he congratulates himself before God. God, aren't I wonderful? Isn't it great for you that I'm on your team? But by contrast, then we have the tax collector. It's interesting that Jesus notes in detail even his body language before we even hear the prayer of the tax collector. He's standing some distance away and his head is bowed. He's clearly mindful of the eyes of judgment upon him. He's unwilling to lift his head and he beats his breast, which is such a sign of sorrow and mourning, right? And he prays, God, have mercy on me, the sinner. He knows who he is, he knows who God is, and he knows what he needs, mercy. And Jesus says, it's that man who went home justified. So again, here we see a story of comparison that led to the other extreme, not to anger, jealousy, or envy, but instead to conceit and pride. And it produced a response that was equally unacceptable to God, like Cain's offering in the beginning. So neither response, neither the anger, nor the envy, nor the conceit, bring God the glory or reflect the work of the Spirit in our lives. That's why Paul ends his Galatians chapter 5 by saying, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, challenging one another, envying one another. So comparison in and of itself isn't the problem, but it can lead to these sinful responses that keep us from loving others and loving God wholeheartedly. 
So the question is, how does Jesus set us free from this? And I would say that he does so in three ways. First, he invites us to dialogue with him about it. When God asked Cain why he was angry, he was giving him an invitation to talk about it with him. Guys, when you feel yourself on either end of the spectrum with comparison, I want to encourage you to accept God's invitation to talk to him about it. Tell him why you're angry, jealous, resentful, feeling hard done by. Or confess your proud feelings and conceit towards someone else and ask God to forgive you. You know, it doesn't have to be any more spectacular than that. John says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us. So get them out in the light. Name them before they can take root. Bitter roots are really, you know, serious things to deal with. So get it out there before it can take root in your heart. I think this is especially important if you notice that your feelings of comparison are causing you to respond in an unchristlike way towards others. In our culture, we are all too quick to justify our dislike of people, but guys, as Christians, we are not free to participate in cancel culture. If your sin is disabling you from loving another person, the response is to get on your knees, confess it, repent of it, and pray for his love for them. So when we face this struggle, the first thing is take it straight to the Lord. Talk to him about it. Remember, you're not alone in this battle. And the reason why is because the second thing he does to help us deal with this is that he gives us his Holy Spirit to enable us to resist these sinful responses. The whole second talk in this series was about how we have the Holy Spirit with us to resist serving sin. Jesus has not left us alone to live the Christian life in our own strength, striving to resist the sin crouching at the door. It's, he hasn't left us alone in that. He empowers us. He is with us. Remember the name of the Holy Spirit in John 14 that we talked about on Sunday. He's the advocate, the helper, the counselor. He is with you, enabling you. He's not a counselor that you pay once a week for an hour in a 10 session block. He is with you always, in every moment, in every conversation. And he gives you the power to react differently. Don't feel you have to conjure up good feelings towards someone if you feel resentful. Ask him to help you get there so that it's genuine. Work with him, yield to him. And one of the things that we're called to do, and indeed one of the things the Holy Spirit enables us to do is flee temptation. So Jesus says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. By which he means, if something is causing you to stumble in your life, seek to remove it, set some boundaries. So one thing that would be helpful to do with the issue of comparison is to identify if there are particular platforms or things that are breeding comparison in your life. Simona mentioned in her talk last time about how following certain people on social media led her to compare herself and feel worse about herself. So what did she do? She identified that trigger point and she set some boundaries. I think that's a really healthy thing to do, especially with social media at the moment. Um, I think it's a, it's a unique problem for our generation because of the sheer amount of information ready at hand, causing us to compare ourselves not just to our neighbors, but to the whole world. I think there's a whole other seminar in here about how to use social media well in a way that's positive and productive, but it's worth thinking to yourself, how can I set some boundaries if I notice that there's something that's particularly fueling this cycle of destructive comparison? And that might take a little bit of self-reflection and prayer, but I recommend doing that. And finally, so first he, he invites us to dialogue with him about it. He gives us his Holy Spirit to resist it. And finally, he calls us to stop looking over our shoulder and instead follow him. In John 21, when Jesus rises from the dead, he goes to meet his disciples for breakfast on the beach. And in his conversation with Peter, he starts to tell Peter what's in store for him when he takes up the call to follow Jesus. And after Peter hears about it, Peter then looks over at John and he asks the Lord, hey, what about him? What's in store for him? And Jesus replies, what is that to you? You follow me. In other words, don't worry about your brother's path. This isn't a comparison game. You follow me. I like the easy to read translation of Galatians 6 verses 4 to 5. It says, don't compare yourself with others. Just look at your own work to see if you've done anything to be proud of. You must each accept the responsibilities that are yours. You see, when we start to follow Jesus, he gives us something new to live for, something, some greater goal to aim for than our own self-glorification. He calls us to stop looking over our shoulder at our brother and instead look ahead and focus on what he's given us to do. So rather than the building of our own kingdoms, 
he calls us to build his. And honestly, I can't think of anything more freeing when it comes to comparison. Because you see, the whole thing is fueled by worldly standards of success, beauty, togetherness, standards that actually change with nearly every generation. And the Lord says, I set you free from that. In fact, I invite you to leave the rat race of self-promotion and step into the graceful journey of building my kingdom. Seek first my kingdom and all these things will be added to you. Friends, that's our invitation to lay aside the worldly standards once and for all as the measuring stick by which you assess if you're good enough. You don't have to be the prettiest, the smartest, the most gifted, the richest, the most successful, the most together person you know. All you must be is in Christ. Seek first his kingdom and these things will be added to you. And this reshaping of our priorities, our goal in life, sets us free to cultivate contentment. I like the word cultivate because it makes me think of a farmer cultivating his crops. They won't grow naturally. They do need to be tended. It's an active process. And that's actually the same thing with contentment. The last place I want to go over this evening is Psalm 37. Um, If you've got your Bible, you could turn there. I love this psalm because straight out of the gate, it helps us think through how to manage our, our feelings when we experience comparison. So he begins by saying, don't fret and don't be envious. Yet he doesn't leave us there with those negative commands. He gives us a positive alternative of what to do instead. He actually gives us seven alternative things to do instead in verses 3 to 5. So verse 3 starts, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. So it's a very active and intentional process. Trust, do good, dwell, cultivate, delight, commit, trust. If you notice, it actually begins and ends with trust. Even the very command, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you is an exercise of trust. If I really lay down my arms and stop fighting for myself, are you gonna take care of me? If I really step out of this comparison trap and the urge to get ahead of the Joneses, will you really give me all I need? Not necessarily all I want, but all I need? The first step in cultivating contentment is to trust him. And then with the other verbs that we have there, get busy living. Get busy living an outward focused life, not an inward focused one. Comparison causes us to look inward at ourselves and God would say, don't look down, look up and look out. Do good, dwell in the land, cultivate faithfulness, delight yourself in the Lord, commit your way to him. And I think part of this process is cultivating thankfulness. When you identify the thing that's tripping you up, see if there's another side to the story. Start looking for what you can be thankful for about the thing that's tripping you up. For instance, in my story at the beginning about body size, it took years and several hip surgeries till I finally began to appreciate the strong body God gave me. By God's grace, because there was a time when I might not be able to hike up mountains or walk more than a mile without pain, my view of my body was completely transformed, and now I praise God for the strong body he's given me. Who the heck cares if I look like a ballerina or not? <laughs> when, I feel, when I feel not skinny enough, I thank him that I'm strong. So often, I don't know how it's been for you, but for me, the Lord has redeemed my issues of comparison, not by changing my circumstances, but by changing my perspective. So this talk was called Freedom from Comparison and Freedom for Contentment. And what I don't want to suggest to you is that, yay, now you follow Jesus, you'll never have thoughts of comparison again, because that's not true. But rather it's to say, yay, you follow Jesus. Now, whenever those thoughts crop up or those nasty comments are made, go to Jesus with them. Run to Jesus and bring him the areas where you feel inadequate, angry, jealous, or conceited. Don't give in to the sin crouching at the door. Actively thank him and remind yourself you're living for his kingdom, not yours. And then get busy living. I want to end with the first line of the most famous psalm there is, Psalm 23. It starts by just saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or literally, I lack nothing. And in my opinion, that is the greatest statement of contentment in the Bible. And something I love so much about it is that up to that point, only one reason has been given so far as to justify his complete contentedness. And that is, the Lord is my shepherd. What I love is, instead of spiraling into self-focus, which leads us to sin, 
he calls us to refocus our eyes and filter our comparisons through him and let him define our worth, a worth that won't fluctuate depending on what, who's in the room with you. So let me go ahead and pray and then we can break into our discussion groups. So Lord, just thank you so much for this time to get to talk about these things. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for your care for us. Thank you so much for calling us to a higher way of walking. Um, Lord, a higher way of walking that actually is for our good. It's for the good of how we see ourselves. It's for the good of our relationships with others. And it's for the good of our relationship with you. I pray, Father, that you would help us as we go away from here thinking about these things. Would you help us be honest with ourselves? I pray for genuine self-reflection, genuine willingness to yield to you and to work with your spirit, that we won't be people who just react out of comparison, but actually walk in a way that would honor you. And in your precious name, I pray these things. Amen.